Welcome back everyone to another reaction video and we are going to dive back into some extra history today. A two-part series they did on the shootout at the OK Corral, a little western U.S. history for us today. It's not a topic we cover a whole lot. I'm going to go ahead and do both parts of it, so this will be a complete reaction to both parts. As always, a link will be in the description that will take you to part one of their original content. Uh, I do a lot, probably more extra history content than any other channel that I react to just because they have very interesting stories. I like the way they tell a story. I think it's engaging, it's interesting, it's informative, and it's in nice bite-sized pieces. So if you want an 8 or 10 minute historical video, this is a great place for you to be able to watch that on their channel. So uh, if you have not already discovered extra history, which I'm guessing you probably have, check it out through the link in the description. Let's go ahead and dive into this one. Tombstone, Arizona Territories, October 26th, 1881. It begins like so many other fights, with a boozy boast. It's 9 yep. in the morning on a cold Wednesday. The bars have been open all night, and Ike Clanton hasn't stopped drinking. Later, he will, of course, sober up, and he will do so very quickly. But that, of course, is later. For now, he's drunk, belligerent, and shouting at anyone who will listen that he's going to kill Doc Holliday a short-tempered former dentist with whom, for reasons that will probably never become fully clear, he's had a long-standing feud with. And it's in this particular moment that he's lit the fuse of a complex, multi-part powder keg that will explode in approximately six hours' time and echo into legend. The gunfight at the OK Corral. He makes a great point there about lighting a fuse. So often in history, we look at the explosion and think that's the cause. But really, that's just the, the, the catalyst event, right? It, it's something that's been building up for a long time. World War One's a classic example. The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand is the explosion. It, it's the fuse that was lit. But the, the stuff that had been sitting there waiting to explode had been sitting there for decades, had been getting built up. And it was just that moment that lit it. This issue between the Earps and the Clantons and the McClowries and the other uh, cowboys and their associated faction, uh, this is something that's been getting built up for time. And this is just the moment that it all comes to a head. Thanks so much to Clarendon and their new cooperative party game, Priorities, hmm. for sponsoring today's historical tale. Tombstone was founded in 1879 by an optimistic prospector named Ed Shifflin. Go prospecting in those hills, local folks told him, and all you're going to find is your tombstone. Yeah, well, Ed got the last laugh, as during his endeavor, he hit a seam of silver and became a very rich man. A mining camp sprung up swiftly after his find, and within two years, it became a prosperous and growing town. And in fond acknowledgement of his many doomsayers, Shifflin named the place Tombstone. Yeah, so uh, pretty cool to see kind of moments when my own family gets connected to that. My wife had a great, great, great uncle who is buried here in Ohio. But when we went looking for him, we couldn't find any record of his death here in Ohio. And it, as it turned out, he ended up in Tombstone, Arizona. He had immigrated here from Wales. He was here for a little while. He goes out to Tombstone, Arizona, is killed in an explosion in a mine, and they shipped his body back here to be buried, or they just put his name on the tombstone here, but he's buried out there somewhere. It's a fascinating place to visit, but it's really kind of in the middle of nowhere now because once the prospecting kind of dried up there, there was really no reason for people to settle in that area. So, I mean, kind of the nearest big city is Tucson, and you're still looking at a pretty significant drive. Really, the only thing that keeps Tombstone going today is tourism. It was a busy modern town filled with bars, restaurants, brothels, and more bars. Yeah, people kind of drank a lot. There wasn't really much else to do with your free time around there. Of course, boredom and liquor often give rise to lawlessness. Mm. And where there's lawlessness, the law tends to follow. In this instance, it came in the shape of one Virgil Earp who had enlisted his younger brothers, Wyatt and Morgan, as deputies. So if you have didn't see my stream the other day where we were doing some uh, family history research, uh, my friend JD from the History Underground suggested that I trace the family tree of John Wayne, the actor whose real name was Marion Morrison. And we found out that his grandfather was in the Civil War. His name was also Marion Morrison. 
And as we went digging, we found out that Marion Morrison, John Wayne's grandfather, was in the same unit as Virgil Earp in the Civil War. So that was a really kind of a, a cool connection between the Western movies and the real Wild West. Yeah, it wasn't Wyatt that was the main honcho here. A bunch of his brothers were there, and Virgil was the main guy. Um, if you haven't already, watch the movie Tombstone. Uh, I would say the movie with... Kevin Costner, which is called Wyatt Earp, is probably more historically accurate, but Tombstone's by far the better movie, uh, and the acting job by uh, Val Kilmer in that one as Doc Holliday is one of the best historic performances I think anybody's ever seen. It's just so good. Uh, and uh, Oh boy, I just messed things up. Speaking of Ike Clanton, who's kind of at the center of all this, played by Stephen Lang, who played Pickett in Gettysburg, Stonewall Jackson in Gods and Generals. He's, of course, in the um, the Avatar movies, and I had a chance to meet him a couple months ago. Very, very gracious, very kind man. Ike Clanton began mouthing off. Virgil had been policing the streets all night long. He's just exhausted yeah. and wants nothing more than to go home and sleep. But the news that Clanton is stumbling around threatening Doc Holliday keeps him out. Now, Virgil normally wouldn't care what nonsense a drunk bully like Clanton might spout, but Doc Holliday is a friend to the Earps. Though, more than that, Virgil also knows that Holiday has a well-earned reputation as a hothead who probably wouldn't think twice about gunning Ike down in the street. For That's the thing you have to remember. This, this is not good guy versus bad guy in a black and white sense. There's a lot of nuance and gray area here. Doc Holliday is a criminal. I mean, let's face it, that's just what he was. He's not a lawman. He's a criminal. He's not an evil guy, but he's a criminal. Um, he, he kind of operates kind of on the fringes of the law, but he is allied and friends with the Earps, who are kind of the law here. But they're also kind of on the edges, and they're going to end up going on this vendetta ride that is extremely outside of the law after all of this goes down. Frankly, Virgil doesn't want to have to deal with the paperwork around that, so he goes to find his brothers. He repeats what he's heard. Now, Virgil knows that Doc and Wyatt are friends, and Doc's the most likely to listen to Wyatt. So Virgil sets his brothers to task and goes home for what's probably the last good night's rest in his life. Wyatt and Morgan then go off to search for Doc, finding him at a card table in the Oriental Saloon. Now, John Henry, Doc Holliday, crossed paths with Wyatt Earp several times before joining yeah. him in Tombstone. Maybe those prior meetings were coincidence, or maybe destiny. Either way, Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday will be inextricably linked due to the events that take place later that day. But right this so Doc Holliday is a southerner. I think he's from Georgia. Uh, and yeah, he was a dentist, but what happened was he couldn't practice his dental work anymore because uh, at a pretty young age, he ends up with tuberculosis, which is eventually going to be fatal in the 19th century to anybody. Even if you live with it for decades, it will eventually be fatal for you. Sometimes they called it consumption uh, at that time. Uh, so he sent out west. It was a common theory at the time that the drier air out west would help with your breathing. Uh, so he goes out west, and he's working further and further west, just as Wyatt Earp is. They, they're kind of in Kansas, and then all the way out to Arizona. Uh, and by this point, he, he obviously can't practice dentistry. You can't be coughing in the faces of your patients. And so he's gone to gambling as a means of making money. Moment, a confrontation seems unlikely. Mm, don't care what Clanton says, Doc reassures the Earps. He couldn't hit a barn door with a banjo. Don't worry none, boys. I'll be fine. He goes back to his game, winning and losing in equal measure. Though for a notorious gambler, Doc never makes his fortune. Whenever he wins big, he just gambles it all away again. He lives in the moment, and for good reason. He's 30 years old, yep. his body is riddled with tuberculosis, and he's living on borrowed time. So he treats every day as a gift, and he's dang sure he will make the most of it. And yeah, and he's uh, he's kind of taken up with this Hungarian woman named, they call Big Nose Kate. Uh, and she's and Wyatt Earp at this time, he's married. He's got this common-law wife that I don't think he's ever actually married, but he's living with her. She's addicted to laudanum. I mean, there's so many facets to this story that you could go into and really take a deep dive on. And perhaps, knowing his life's outlook, Wyatt and Morgan are not entirely reassured at Doc's response, but leave the former dentist to his card games and go on with their day, keeping one eye open. Elsewhere, Ike Clanton keeps drinking. Now, nobody ever quite put their finger on exactly why Ike Clanton was baying for Doc Holliday's blood. 
Though there was some whispers that Wyatt and Doc had collaborated with Clanton on a probably less than legal money-making scheme. Ike got the idea that Doc was going to betray him to the authorities, started drinking, and then that idea became his reality. Actually, he'd aggressively confronted Doc the previous night, but nobody really noticed. See, because not a day went by in Tombstone without someone mm. mortally offending someone else. Virgil had introduced a no guns within the city limits law that... So this is something that's really important to help understand the context, and this is why it's always important to understand context. Because outside of this con context of Tombstone, you might look at that and say, how could people not see this coming? There was all this bad blood. There were there was this argument the night before. How did people not see this coming? Well, exactly for the reasons that he said. In Tombstone, there are arguments like that all the time. Whereas if it happened in your own town and you saw that happen today, people might think something of it. But at that time, at that place, it wasn't a big deal because 99% of the time when people got into ar drunken arguments like that, nothing became of it people occasionally adhered to, which meant that Doc and Ike's spat shouldn't really escalate beyond harsh language. And Doc brushed off Ike with the disdain he felt he deserved. So there's a very good chance that Ike, Wyatt, and Doc were mixed up in something that they shouldn't have been. And while Wyatt and Doc were able to keep their mouths tightly shut, the neurotic clint. I don't know that I would go that far. I think maybe they're putting a little bit too much of their own opinion into this part right here. I don't think that there's enough evidence there to say that they were involved in something one way or another. Uh, I think they were accused of it. I don't know. Clinton simply could not. His own certainty that Doc was going to get him into trouble took over everything. Of course, it probably doesn't help that Ike was, to put it bluntly, not the brightest button in the box. And Doc did take pleasure in denigrating his intelligence yeah. by confounding the farmer with riddles and conundrums. Doc also considered himself too And, and they, they actually allude to this in the movie Tombstone. Like at one point, Doc makes a joke and says, I know, let's have a spelling contest. And, you know, so he, he does insult his intelligence, uh, Ike's intelligence, uh, on a regular basis in the film. And sophisticated for Tombstone and never thought twice about causing offense. Yeah, Doc Holliday was not a nice man. No. His illness is hard on him and he numbs that pain with booze. This serves only to make him more angry, more bitter, and that means he's a man who frequently acts first and thinks later, often from behind cell bars. But back to Ike. Finally kicked out of the last bar in town, Ike has to quit drinking. Maybe he sleeps the worst of it off somewhere, or maybe he just goes home and knocks back a few more glasses of old Overholt, but wherever he is, he exits stage left for now. Leaving and a little bit of context, not long before this, there was a uh, a marshal in town. His name was Marshal White. I think Bill White, maybe. Um, and he had been killed by a guy named Curly Bill Brocious, who was a friend of the Clantons, the McLowrys, that whole faction. There are these kind of two sides going here. And you have another guy um, who was played by Michael Bean in the movie, uh, whose name is Johnny Ringo, uh, who's going to end up dying under mysterious circumstances. And uh, Curly Bill shoots and kills the marshal and claims self-defense. He claimed he was trying to hand over his gun and it went off, but pretty much everybody thinks he actually killed him. And, and Wyatt comes out and kind of uh, pistol whips him and knocks him out immediately after he shoots him. Uh, so that's just one of those episodes in all of this that kind of led to this moment. So you've got a history of lawmen being gunned down by that side already. So that ups the tension a little bit room for us to bring in the other players in this sorry tale. Tom McClary, Ike's friend, has heard what's going on and has come to town to see if he can help, or as it's more likely, catch a piece of whatever action is going on. Unfortunately for Tom, he makes the mistake of running into Wyatt first, whose patience is easily tested. The two get into a disagreement, which ends, as many things do, with Wyatt pistol whipping him and dragging him into the courthouse for disturbance of the peace. Just one more bullet into the six-shooter yep. of destiny. Yep. Okay, all of the pieces are nearly on the board. We have the three Earp brothers. We have Doc Holliday. We have Ike and Tom. All we need now is Tom's older brother, Frank, and Ike's baby brother, Billy. Those two are currently minding their own business, eating lunch at the Grand Hotel. And you know what? They're probably having a pretty nice day. When all of a sudden, someone crashes in to tell Frank and Billy that Ike is on the warpath and Tom has incurred the wrath of Wyatt Earp. That's probably when their nice day came to an end. Actually, there's something in the air in Tombstone today, and it's not just the chill or the snow. 
There's a sense of hush, kind of like the town taking a deep breath before plunging into a lake. Ike's friends go out hunting for him in hopes of sobering him up, but to no avail. So the Clantons and McClaurys just meet up and begin to whisper in hushed tones, while the Earps meet at Haffer's Corner, whispering in hushed tones hmm. of their own. Destiny is hollering, yeah. and the two factions are ready to answer the siren's call. Now it's around three in the afternoon when Doc saunters by, unaware or simply not caring that he's caused this tension. He's reminded about Ike's threats of murder, and once again, just shrugs it off. And again, this this was stuff that had happened before. There had been plenty of tension before. It's just that this time, they go down a different road with it. So I guess what I'm saying is, there's probably no reason, even at this moment, for anybody on either side to think that this is going to come to actual shooting. Then Virgil, perhaps foolishly, tells Doc that the brothers are going to find the Clantons and the McClarys. Doc wants in, but Virgil tells him there's no need for him to get involved. And here is where Doc's famous temper begins to flare up, at being told to stay out of business that is quite clearly his to be involved in. That is a hell of a thing for you to say, Doc says to Virgil. To which Virgil concedes that Doc is too involved to actually not be involved. Mm -hmm. So he accepts Doc's offer to help watch their backs and swaps his shotgun with the dentist's walking cane. This allows Virgil to approach unarmed and thus appear conciliatory rather than threatening. Now you're just there to back me up, Virgil tells Doc, pointing to the shotgun. You understand? Oh, Doc understands. Mm -hmm. A helpful passerby informs the lawmen that the Clantons and the... So, again... As I'm saying, there's shades of gray here. It's not just simply good versus good guy versus bad guy. You're the law, Virgil Earp. Why are you putting a shotgun in the hand of a man that you know has got a temper, already has it out for these guys? You're just putting a few more barrels of gunpowder onto this powder keg that's about to explode. So should have known better. Clarys were seen buying ammunition a little while ago, then headed off to collect their horses. Huh, maybe, Virgil suggests, they're already leaving town. But the Earps decide it's best to make sure that they actually do leave. Walking in a line, with Doc whistling a cheerful tune and a shotgun concealed beneath his great coat, they all saunter down the street and in to immortality. Hmm. Now, there are countless fictional retellings of the altercation, and nobody will ever know the full facts. Heck, even Wyatt Earp, when pressed, couldn't remember the specifics. <laughs> but one thing is for certain. In our next episode, 30 shots will ring out over Tombstone. One for each second of a legendary gunfight. Mm. Ticked. All right, let's go ahead and dive right into part two. All right, so as we get into part two, just a couple of notes of background here. I'm sure they're going to mention the fact this gunfight did not actually take place at the OK Corral. It sounds... Really cool to say the gunfight at the OK Corral, but it was like several doors down from the OK Corral where this happened. It was actually next to a photography studio. Uh, the other thing is that Tombstone, don't think of this as a small town at this point. This is a pretty substantial sized town. There's about 7,000 people in Tombstone at this point, which doesn't sound like a lot to you and me now, but at that time and place in the American Southwest, 20 miles from the Mexican border. This is a big place. Uh, so I think there was a fire going on at a building in town and people were dealing with that. So people were focused on other things. There's a lot going on. It's not like the entire town watched these guys march down the street and saw this all take place. There was a lot of busyness happening. Fremont Street, Tombstone, Arizona Territories, October 26th, 1881. Now, gunshots are not uncommon in a town where disagreements happen on a daily basis. 30 of them, though. Now, yeah. that's unusual. In a vacant lot off Fremont Street, next to Fly's photographic studio, two groups that have been staring each other down for weeks are about to collide. One faction, known as the Cowboys, have been feuding with the gambler-slash-dentist Doc Holliday. And the tension's gotten so bad that Doc's friend, Deputy Marshal Virgil Earp, has ordered them to leave town before violence erupts. Mm. They're in an alley near the OK Corral, readying their horses, and maybe if they'd been left alone, they would have followed his instructions. But Virgil and his brothers, plus Holiday himself, are on their way to make sure the cowboys really leave. They're coming with guns. And soon, Fremont Street will ring with those aforementioned 30 mm. shots, raining through the town in 30 seconds.
Today's epic showdown is made possible by our creator-owned and operated streaming service, Nebula, where lifetime memberships are back for a limited time this holiday season. But more on that after the shootout. Okay, let's fully set the scene of this showdown, shall we? On one side, the Cowboys. Ike Clanton, whose drunken threats to kill Doc Holliday have started this mess, plus his little brother Billy. Next to them, Tom and Frank McClary have already saddled their horses and are ready to leave. And So I want to, just for context, I, I like to be able to do this. I want to take a look at a map of Tombstone from 1881 and, and kind of lay this out for us a little bit. So right over here is where the Earps live uh, on the corner of 1st Street in Fremont. Um, you see some other events here that are not associated with this particular day. Uh, the red light district's down here. That's where your prostitutes are going to be, things like that. Uh, here's the site of the gunfight on the corner of 3rd and Fremont. OK Corral entrance is actually off of Allen Street over here, so you're kind of near the back of the OK Corral. Um, but that's, you know, it, it's kind of like when you're describing to a person that you know, oh, uh, I live over by Walmart. Well, you might not live next to Walmart, but Walmart's like the big business that's close to your house, so it helps people orient in their minds. Same thing here. This gunfight didn't play, take place at the OK Corral, but it's the nearest thing that people could connect it to in terms of a map in their minds of where this all happened. Finally, their friend Billy Claiborne makes five. And on the other side are the lawmen. Deputy Marshal Virgil Earp, his brothers Wyatt and Morgan, and their friend Doc Holliday. Five cowboys, four lawmen. Fairly even odds. Not that odds matter to Virgil, however. He's focused, determined to see the cowboys out of town with as little fuss as possible. And I wouldn't say even odds. It's even maybe in terms of numbers, but we're talking about uh, like Virgil Earp's a Civil War veteran. Wyatt's got a lot of law experience. He's shot people before. Uh, Doc Holliday has definitely probably shot people before. Uh, there's a lot more experience on the side of the Earps than there is on the other side. The McClary's horses partially obscure the cowboys from Virgil's sight, so he can't really see what they're doing. But he steps forward regardless to take control of the situation. Throw your hands up, boys, he says. I want your guns. Mind you, Virgil isn't holding a gun. He borrowed Doc's silver-topped walking cane. And we should mention as well that before this happened, the sheriff, a guy named Johnny Behan, had come up and tried to stop the Earps and Doc Holliday from coming to this situation and said, oh, I already disarmed them. And they just kind of ignore him because everybody kind of thought that the sheriff was in the pocket of the Cowboys at this point. It was kind of on their side, so they really just didn't take him seriously. The two sides are about eight feet apart when Doc raises his shotgun. He doesn't fire it, however. He's just covering Virgil, keeping his promise to only fire if absolutely necessary. But at the sight of the weapon, Frank McClary and Billy Clanton draw and aim their revolvers. Hold, Virgil says, stepping forward and raising the walking cane. I don't want that. The first two shots being fired before he even finishes his sentence. Perhaps the raised cane looked more threatening than he thought. And to this day, it's unclear exactly who shot first. Billy Clanton then shoots at Wyatt. And in response, Wyatt fires at the bigger threat, Frank McClary, who has a reputation as a gunfighter. At these shots... And, and right here is where that experience matters, keeping a cool head. Instead of just fire, firing blindly, Wyatt goes for the biggest threat first. He's thinking very clearly in this minute. Billy Claiborne books it out the back, exiting our story as quickly as he arrived. Then Ike Clanton, who again instigated all of this, rushes up to Wyatt, babbling that he's unarmed. Wyatt shoves him away. Get to fighting or get out of here. Yep. Ike runs for That's his exactly life. Exactly what he told him. Meanwhile, Morgan draws and fires off two shots of his own. Virgil, swearing and fumbling with Doc's cane, finally drops it and cross draws his own weapon. Amid the chaos, though, Doc hasn't fired. He's still following Virgil's orders. The gunshots echoing in the confined space spooks the horses. They rear and buck, adding to the confusion. Then Tom McClary throws his hand to his right hip, ready to draw his weapon, but Doc responds instinctively. He steps around the horse, acting as Tom's shield, and unloads both barrels of the shotgun directly into Tom's chest. And some versions of this story have... Doc either shooting the horse or firing to scare the horse to buck up. But there was already so much firing going on that the idea that he fired his shotgun in order to get the horse to move so he could get a clear shot doesn't make a lot of sense in the context of the story. McClary staggers back but doesn't fall. Doc throws the spent shotgun down, drawing his revolver and rejoining the fight. Everybody's shooting now. 
Billy Clanton's hit in the side and falls to the ground. Morgan is struck in his right shoulder, the bullet tearing through his body and out the other side, missing vital organs by inches. Today isn't Morgan's day to die. Wyatt blazes it will be Frank, soon, hitting him in the abdomen, while Frank stumbles away, trying to get to his horse. A lucky shot from Billy Clanton strikes Virgil in the calf. But with the tenacity and sheer bloody-mindedness of his family, Virgil keeps fighting. Morgan does too, dragging himself up to a sitting position so he can keep shooting. Only Wyatt has stood still this entire gunfight. Doc's world narrows. It's him and Frank McClurry now. He sights in. But suddenly, a wild shot grazes Doc's hip, infuriating him. He squeezes the trigger. But nothing happens. A misfire out of ammunition? Ugh, it hardly matters. In this moment, Doc realizes that this is how he dies. He embraces the notion, flings his arms out, presenting himself as a target to Frank. I have you now, Lunger, Frank growls, raising his gun. Blaze away, Frank, Doc says. You're a daisy if you have. But just as Frank is about to put a hole in Doc, Wyatt and Morgan zero in on him, firing almost simultaneously. And a fingernail-sized ball of lead slams into Frank's skull, killing him in an instant. Silence descends. The men look through the drifting gun smoke at what the past half minute has wrought. Frank McClary's dead. The wounded Tom follows him into eternity shortly afterwards. 19-year-old Billy Clanton mm. takes longer to expire, in terrible, agonizing pain despite two shots of morphine. Among the lawmen, two of the Earp brothers and Doc Holliday are injured, with only Wyatt escaping entirely unscathed. And this adds to the legend that is Wyatt Earp. By this point, he's already made a lot of that legend uh, because of his work in places like Kansas. Uh, but the fact that he's the only guy on both sides of this that doesn't get hit that was doing any firing, obviously the guys who ran, that's one story, but of the people who stayed and fought, Wyatt's the only guy who doesn't get hit. And that there's another instance that's going to happen later in another battle, the one where they kill Curly Bill Brocious, where again, he like people are just going to be shocked by the fact that he somehow isn't hit in the midst of all of this. The fight was over, but in many ways, the feud was just beginning. That's true. After the events of that fateful October day in Tombstone, things unraveled quickly. The Earps and Doc were arrested and tried for the murder of the McClary brothers and Billy Clanton. Yeah, that's a part nobody talks about. There was a trial uh, because there are competing law uh, organizations going on here, right? you got the sheriff of the county. You've got the law in town. You've got federal marshals. And everybody has their own jurisdictions. And there's competing jurisdictions. There is a trial. They're found not guilty. But then the revenge killings start. And though they were acquitted within a month, the bile did not settle. Two months after the gunfight, a group of men ambushed Virgil in the street, shooting him in the back with three loads of buckshot. He survived, but lost the use of his left arm. Several men from the cowboy faction, including Ike Clanton, were arrested for the crime, but then let go for lack of evidence. In May, several months after the Fremont Street fight, another group of assassins murdered Morgan Herb, shooting him in the back as he played billiards. Wyatt then loaded the wounded Virgil onto a train with Morgan's body and went out for vengeance. Forming a federal posse that included Holiday, Wyatt led a vendetta that sought out... And nobody talks about the fact that, that there were other members of the Earp family, too. I think his brother James was there, which, again, you see in the movie Wyatt Earp in a way that you don't see in Tombstone. Sometimes the best history isn't always the best movie, the best story. Tombstone is a much more entertaining film, but Wyatt Earp is a much more accurate one. Any allies of the cowboys he could find. They killed four men and fled to Arizona after being charged with murder and pursued by marshals. But that's a story for another time. And this is called the Earp Vendetta Ride. They go and they kill Curly Bill. They kill Johnny Ringo. Uh... Ike Clanton escapes all of that, but ends up dying later on. I think he's killed by somebody completely unrelated to all of this. Eventually, life returned to whatever passed for normal in Tombstone. The Earps never did end up mining for silver like they intended to. Doc never made his fortune playing cards. Though eventually, he did head out to Colorado, where he passed away six years later at the age of 36, dying just as he'd lived, in debt and defiant. And in Tombstone, the altercation was largely forgotten. After all, it was not the only feud or shootout in the West yeah. at that time, and was only notable in how many died. Only years later, when he was being interviewed for his biography as a frontier lawman, that Wyatt Earp discussed the Fremont Street fight. And by that time, his recollections were hazy. 
Details have been called into question, including the time frame and number of bullets fired. Modern reenactments of the gunfight average around 19 bullets in a 30 second period, rather than his claim of 30. Maybe Wyatt was exaggerating? People like the symmetry of 30 bullets in 30 seconds. It probably was not nearly that many, um, unless you had a lot of shots that just missed, and it doesn't seem likely that there was a lot of wasted ammunition here. Uh, just like people say tw uh, that Billy the Kid killed 21 people in his 21 years. He didn't kill anywhere near that many people. Maybe he truly didn't recall. Still, that account caught the spirit of a generation who yep. viewed those heady days of the Wild West as something mythological and who were very eager for tales of the past. The story took off like wildfire, and despite Wyatt always referring to it as the Fremont Street fight. Because it didn't happen at the OK Corral. It just sounds cool that way. And it having taken place in an empty lot, early newspaper accounts saddled it with the name of the nearby OK Corral, and popular culture followed suit. Wyatt himself ended up living through the turn of the century and got to witness things like the birth of Hollywood. And in his later years, he actually became an advisor on several silent Western films. And John Wayne once claimed that he modeled his own cowboy persona after Earp after having met him once on a film set. By the time Wyatt died in 1929, at the age of 80, the story of the gunfight at the OK Corral had taken on a life of its own. The first movie depiction came in 1932, hmm. followed by eight more television got in on the action as well, and so by the end of the century, the gunfight had been immortalized in countless films and adaptations, each more dramatic than the last, and each equally loose with the facts. Many of the depictions outright cast the Earps as heroic lawmen, despite history telling us their motives were likely a little more murky. Yeah. But perhaps the after effects of the gunfight linger most in Tombstone itself, whose tourism industry is built around the violent conflict, which is reenacted multiple times a day. And yeah, we got to see it. In fact, the first time my wife saw the movie Tombstone was in the car on the way to Tombstone, Arizona. Uh, it's a cool place to visit. It's really kind of out of the way. It's not really near anything major and the, like i said the only reason tombstone even still exists is because of tourism otherwise there'd be no reason for that to even be a town there an event vaguely recalled by one of its only survivors which grew into an american legend famous around the world one where over 150 years later you can still see two groups of men approaching each other in front of fremont street Across from the OK Corral. So I'm really curious to see what newspapers at the time had to say about it. So I'm going to look and see if we can find any. So this is the Arizona Weekly Citizen. It's a Sunday paper from October 30th, 1881. This is like right after it happened. This is in Tucson, which is kind of one of the nearest newspapers to all of this. Uh, so Marshall Virgil Earp, Morgan and Wyatt Earp, and Doc Holliday meet the Cowboys. Three men killed and two wounded, one seriously. Origin of the trouble and its tragic termination. Uh, so it says the 26th of October will always be marked as one of the crimson days in the annals of Tombstone, a day when blood flowed as water and human life was held as shuttlecock, a day always to be remembered as witnessing the bloodiest and deadliest street fight that has ever occurred in this place or probably in the territory. So it goes back and it starts talking about the arrest of Stillwell and Spencer for the robbery of the Bisbee stage, which is what they referred to earlier as something maybe Wyatt was involved in. Uh, so, th I mean, this is this is a couple days after the event, and they're already making the connections between earlier events. Uh, Ike Clanton and Doc Holliday had some difficulty at the Alhambra Saloon. Hard words passed between them, and when they parted, it was generally understood that the feeling of these two men was that of intense hatred. And uh, it says here that uh, while in the courtroom, Wyatt Earp told him that he had made threats against his life, and he wanted to make him uh, he wanted him to make his fight to say how, when, and where he would fight, and to get his crowd. And he, Wyatt, would be on hand. In reply, Clanton said, four feet of ground is enough for me to fight on, and I'll be there." And so it goes on to describe here. Here we go. Uh, it is now about two o'clock, and at this time, Sheriff Behan appeared upon the scene and told Mar Marshal Earp that if he disarmed his posse composed of Morgan and Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday, he would go down to the OK Corral where Ike and James Clanton and Frank and Tom Clowey were and disarm them. So he didn't tell him he had already disarmed them. At least according to this story, he said, disarm and then I'll go disarm them. And, and he's trying to kind of keep this from coming to blows. And then here we go. He came down Fremont Street toward the corral and the sheriff stepped out. 
And he says, don't go down there or there will be trouble. Uh, but they passed on, and when within a few feet of them, the marshal said to the Clantons and McClowers, Throw up your hands, boys. I intend to disarm you. Uh, McClowry made a motion to draw his revolver, and when Wyatt Earp pulled his and shot him, the ball striking on the right side of his abdomen. At the same time, Doc Holliday shot Tom McClowry in the right side using a short shotgun, such as is carried by the Wells Fargo and Company messengers. Billy Clanton had shot at Morgan Earp, the ball pl- passing through the left shoulder blade across his back uh and then here it is i mean this is a quote from four days after the event as he started across the street he pulled his gun down on holiday saying i've got you now blaze away you're a daisy if you have replied doc i think in the movie tombstone he says you're a daisy if you do um this shot of mclowers passed through holiday's pistol pocket just grazing the skin so fascinating and this is just one uh, of the news stories that appeared. And this one appeared, like I said, in a tombstone uh, or in a Tucson paper immediately after the events. So I'm sure other newspapers then picked this up and probably within a week or so, it was it was all over the country. So there's one uh, here, December 21st, 1881, the Marion Star. That's the paper that would be owned by uh, President Warren Harding uh, that talks about it. Uh, obviously, Kansas is going to run some news stories about it. 21st December, same thing. Um, so it looks like it took a little bit of time. Uh, looks like this one here, this is Friday, October 28th. So this is even sooner after the events. Uh, it's run in the evening news in Emporia, Kansas. Uh, it's a much smaller article about it, uh, talking about it. But uh Really cool stuff, and I I encourage you, if you have any interest in doing research or reading about historic events, websites like newspapers.com is a great place, or newspaperarchive.com. They've got a lot of old newspapers. You can do a lot of research and find some really fascinating stuff. So check those out if you get a chance. Thanks for watching.